So what we're doing today, we're off to Delapray Abbey. So we can't get out of the car because it is so windy, but that's the Queen Eleanor 
what's it, what's it called? The Queen Eleanor Cross? Yeah. Or, or one of them. This is the one yeah. that's at Northampton. Look at the trees in the wind. Look at that. Yeah. yeah. Would have gone a bit closer, but um, not in this. Right, so this is Delapray Abbey, and I had no idea there was an abbey here. Mm -hmm. And on the right hand side of here, just up, up slightly, is the Delapray Golf Course. So here we are, Suzanne, are you looking forward to this? Um, yeah. You're not sure, are you? No. because you're so fussy with your hair. This way, yeah. I believe. Right, which do we want, Sam? The stable rooms, the battlefield rooms, the medieval rooms, the nine rooms, whatever that is, the bouveret, is that rooms? And the garden rooms, there, yeah, that way. We'll go this way. Delapray Abbey. No, I had no idea this was even here. Before we go to that battle room, I just wanted to pop my head in here because I did have a sneak look. And there we are, look. There's the golf course I was mentioning. So the abbey is. Where's the abbey on that? There's the road we came around, so it must be that side. Yeah, so there's the abbey. And there's the golf course that I've played. Experience the downfall of the king, of a king. obviously. Isn't it? That's referring to That's a good way of revealing the history, isn't it? For the rich and for the poor. It just gradually just goes up to as far as there. Yeah. Um, I mean, a common example of the thing that was being dangerous was the King of Scotland who was um, supervising siege at the same, the same, exactly the same time as Battle of London was going on. He actually was, he was um, a basic foot soldier, you got that. Kind of Chinese style. And basically, padded jacket. And if you were uh, a knight. Not such a good idea because somebody misjudged the powder charge of the cannon, set it fire off, rather than sending the cannonball going, <laughs> it actually killed, it actually exploded. It actually
Mary de la Prez, St. Mary of the Meadows, an arrival that would be the herald of a time of great bloodshed, death, and much change. Mother Goneril, the abbess, told us that our glorious King Henry, along with Queen Margaret, and the 10,000 Lancastrian soldiers now packed in the fields next to us, had for many weeks been holding court at Coventry. But on hearing that the great rebel Duke of York had returned to England to reclaim his lands and titles, and that his son, the Earl of March, and his wife's brother, the great Earl of Warwick, were marching north towards us from London, with many men at their command, the King's Court came away from Coventry to Northampton. Many great lords were with the King, including the Duke of Buckingham, who was our own Earl of Northampton, and also the Earl of Shrewsbury, and Egremont. We heard too that the Queen and Prince Edward accompanied the King. The King had brought with him many soldiers, archers, footmen, men on horse, and we were told too that they had many of the new dreadful weapon of war that they call a gun. With them too is the Archbishop of Canterbury and an envoy of our most holy father, Pope Pius II, Francesco Capini, the Bishop of Turin, and many more princes of the church. So what's a cannonometer? It's basically a way of measuring. They moved to defend the rebel north, but were cut down right, and killed so outside the king's own tent with to, many other. If you get it to leaders. there, you've got it just right. King himself was but if you get it all the way to the top, it, it means you've put too much into the arch. into the bag. However, the Yorkists actually didn't want to actually fight. They were hoping to try and try and persuade the king that his councillors were bad people. They were giving him bad advice, and that they were in the right to do what they did. Fighting for them was literally a last resort. Right, is this what we're looking for? I think so. Two pillars. Two pillars. Oh, yeah. Hello. Oh, come on in. You Thank you. In. Thank you. <laughs> so you've just come in through the 18th century door there into basically a 19th century corridor here. And because this present building follows the ground plan of the abbey. This would have been part of the cloister, which goes round in a square round the central courtyard, which is behind that wall. Okay. okay. Now we're going into the north range, which is the oldest part of the abbey. But this little object here is the first thing we have to show you. And because this was part of the cloister, the nuns coming from their dormitory at that end to go to the church at this end would have needed something to indicate where they were because they'd come down here in the middle of the night between two and three in the morning to start their first lot of prayers. So complete darkness outside of course. Mm -hmm. No wonderful Northampton street lights or anything like that. So complete darkness and so they needed this. You're here. And room one here. It's the beginning of the nuns' story. And the first nuns who arrived here in 1145, so mm -hmm. over 900 years ago, they arrived. Number two, again, gives you more details about the nuns and what they were doing. And you'll meet some of the nuns in there as well. And they, they, will, they will sing to you very sweetly. Not the original nuns, hopefully. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that when you know, we have children coming around and say, yeah. Yeah, you'll meet some of the nuns and they, 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 they come through the wall every morning. <laughs> what are you having to eat? Jack potato and cheese. Right, the spiral staircase. Where did the service go to? Somewhere, and then it goes to the Bouvier room. That's the grand room. It goes to somewhere. <laughs> okay. He said there'd be some people in here. I can't see none. Walking to the Abbey, I was amazed by its stunning beauty. How can such a resource be on my doorstep? I must investigate this one wonder more thoroughly. And that's the same for me, really. Until I saw it come up on Facebook, I had no idea. Look at this 
I was just looking at the rocking horse. Oh yeah, that's lovely, isn't it? Little doll's pram. Uh -huh. Yeah, so this must have been the nursery and schoolroom, I would imagine. The nine rooms find nine objects that reveal our 900 year history. The sewing room. Right. And your broom there, look. Ah. Oh. <laughs> What's that? Zooch. Yeah. Tate's kitchen. Oh, it's breezy in here. Mind that door doesn't slam. Now oh, look at that for a fireplace. So this is the area you've been looking for, is it, Suzanne? Putting faces to names. Who do we have? Unlike many country houses, Delafray Abbey does not have a surviving collection of family portraits, and until recently, we had little idea of what the main characters in our heir to Delapre's story look like. But thanks to some detective work and help from living descendants, the wider Bouvier family had been able to trace, recover and reproduce some portraits of the main family members. There's a nice um, window up there, look. Oh yeah, this is lovely, isn't it? And I would imagine that that's the coat of arms. Quite a small room to have three huge columns like that, isn't it? Yeah. The Bouveret Rooms, from Scandal to Ruin, the Heir of Delaprey. Hmm. So is it any of these doors, do you think? Or maybe these? And as I mentioned earlier on in the vlog, across there is actually the golf course. Now, this is a beautiful room, isn't it? This is the drawing room, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's a bit warmer than the kitchen. Nice and cosy, isn't it? <laughs> so this is the South Range rooms. These are the rooms, in particular after 1764, that the uh, family would have lived in entirely rooms upstairs and these rooms here. They wouldn't have ventured too much into that medieval zone, which is yeah. uh, uh, staff quarters, if you like. This ceiling was put together or commissioned by John Augustus Shield Bouvery. Uh, he also did the salon. You see his initials on the ceiling. And this is his wife here and his five daughters. Oh, wow. And we don't know who actually painted it, but John Augustus commissioned it. And when he arrived here, he didn't have any money, but he was able to borrow a lot of money on the basis of this building. So he uh, went out and spent a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> Including all of this decor, uh, the cafe was a glass conservatory, which he built. Next to the cafe is the billiard room, which he built as well. Is that the room that's now the restaurant next to it's the It's now the restaurant. Room. They've just moved in there last yeah. week, actually. That's a oh, new I just thing had for us. Peep in there because we were in the orange room. And you that should was... go in and if you. If, um, I haven't been in since the restaurant moved in there, and I think they're only in there three days a week Wednesday, right. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I think. Oh, this look... is only last week that they've moved in. Yeah, look looked lovely in there anyway. Uh, prior to that, it was the, the billiard room, and that was where we had our afternoon teas. It was a beautiful room to sit in. Uh, and, and even more so when you look at the photographs of what the building looked like. Of course, you know this building underwent four years of restoration. Uh, so, uh, you know, prior to that four years, this building was unrecognisable, in, in particular. The dining room here, which you're about to go into, and the, the billiard room, which were completely derelict. There are two doors here, which is unusual, two doors. And the reason, quite simply, is that the family were here having a meal. And the meal was finished, they would either go through the men's billiard room or the ladies into the withdrawing room, but they would not want to be interrupted by any noise. Yeah. 
clearly in the room and would have uh, would have made. So two room, two doors there to keep the place quiet for the family. Yeah. And such was the case really that the the servants would never interact really with the family. So the medieval rooms that you would just come through very much the servants' quarters, right. upstairs, downstairs. It's like watching uh, downtown. downtown. You should have come to our downtown tour. We've just finished it. We did it for a month there. Oh, and we actually talked about the people who walked and lived here as, as servants. That is. Yeah. Uh, and that's the first time we had done that. And we dressed up appropriately and we, oh, wow. we let everybody see from the minute they came in the door because we didn't, we didn't allow you in the front door because the servants didn't come in the front yeah. door. <laughs> is that original? Would this be the entertainment? Uh, in fact, it's not original. Uh, it's not original from Victorian times, but it is what we call a Victorian puppet theatre. And what we do here is every now and again, and I'm one of the puppeteers actually, uh, there's two of us trained to use this. This is what we explain to people is what Victorian people would have sat and watched either for entertainment or even news. And they would bring people in that had various, we call these puppets, they're not really puppets. Uh, but they would bring in characters to try and help to explain to the family, either as entertainment, you know, for the children, or really for news, you know, if something happened somewhere, then they would want to know about it. And this particular thing here, we tell the story of John Augustus Shield Bouvery coming here. And uh, it's a story of the family. It runs for about 20 minutes or so. And uh, I'll let me show you briefly what it works. So we would open it up like this. First thing we would do is we would start off. This has been in cold storage for a really while. Well. So what we do is we have characters operating from this side and characters operating from that side. And uh, we have a bit of audio which you won't hear too well on my phone, but I'll let you hear it anyway. You'll hear a bit of it. But this is this is kind of how it goes. If you can bear with me if I can find it. It's been a few weeks since we since we did this but it's hugely entertaining for the kids. I can find it. Bear with me. Technology. <laughs> oh, right. OK. Let's try this. So we have a script behind us here. And we're following the script on the audio as well. So we know what characters come in at certain times. And we know when to uh, do certain things. So we start off with Act one, scene one. So you, you get this music, and, and we turn, we, we cut up. I think I could actually sit and watch that, uh, the show on that. I could. Well, it's actually interesting. It's interesting you say that because my boss here was talking about when we should get it going live again. And something that she said to me, I have to pick it up on. Uh, she said something about because we really need to be entertaining the kids, blah, 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 blah. And not for the first time I've told her, but this is not really for kids. Yeah. Of course it's the kids, the kids come out. Yeah. But the story is a fascinating story. It only lasts about 20 minutes, but by the time you've heard the story, you've heard about the owner who was here, and how John Augustus came on scene, and how they had this problem with the court as to whether he was legitimate or not, blah, 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 blah. And I think it's just slightly above kids. Mm. Mm. They get to see these puppets coming on, yeah. but they don't really know the story. But you two would. Yeah. Yeah. You would Take think, oh, listen, yeah. that, you've, you've just heard the history of this place. 18th century onwards, uh, 19th century onwards, in the space of about 20 minutes. And you're watching the characters, and it just comes slightly to life. Oh. Everard Bovary walking around the grounds here. Yeah. And he meets John, who comes in, and he yeah. talks to him, and the voices are on this thing. And they're having this interaction, and he's not happy, blah, 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 he goes away. We have to keep changing the scenery, so what, what, when you're trained, and I have to say you have to be trained, because you have to work with a colleague, and you have to work in total synchronicity, and yeah. when we have the first act finished, we've got about 30 seconds because we don't want anybody to get bored to change the scenery. So the scenery can be taking place here in, in the library, 
or the scenery can be out on the grounds. Uh, the scenery can also be when Everard passes away and, and he's been taken to his place of rest and, and we tell the story, blah, 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 blah. So it actually is something that uh, is, I think, very entertaining for more of an adult thing. So I said, to her, I, said we, I think we need to refocus, if you don't mind me saying so, <laughs> from children uh, to adults. And instead of doing it as a kind of children's thing on a particular day, why don't we do it more often and just allow the, uh, you know, and, and she's, she thinks that's a good point. Yeah, I think it's, I think I it'd think be good. It's, and it's interesting, you should, and yeah. I'll feed that back to her. And I if, you, if you ever you get say, fed up with you'd it, you'd like to see that. I would, and if ever you get fed up with it, I'd love it in my man cave at home. Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> oh, I, 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 I'd, be, um, I'd be playing with that a lot. Yeah, I, think it's, yeah. I think it's brilliant, I really do. Let, let me show you behind it here. Oh, God, it'll be me. So there's, there's, oh, yeah. there's the script. Similar to a proper stage, really. Yeah, with yes, exactly. So what we're doing is we're listening to what's being said on the audio there. And uh, this is scene one. Uh, what one is this? Uh, episode. We, we have three episodes. Episode one, two, and three. And in each episode, we have three acts or scenes. This happens to be episode two. So scene one. So we have to do all of these changes of... Uh, you know, this is to be done fairly quickly. Put to the side and we change it. Yeah. And then if we have to go back to the side, we have to very quickly while you're talking amongst ourselves. Uh, put that back on again. Whilst the curtain is down, of course. Yeah. And uh, as you can see, it's been a few weeks since I did it. But when Graham and I were doing it regularly, we had this down to a fine art. We were doing it very, very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we follow the story that way. So we're listening to the audio, but then so are you. We've got loudspeakers here, so you hear it much, yeah. much clearer than that. Of course, that's just my phone. And uh, we just follow it this way, and we have to have our characters prepared. Uh, now, this is a character coming in from that side, obviously, because you can't do it that side. So he's coming in there, and you can tell we've written their hearse. So we know our cues tell us that the hearse is coming on. So the hearse comes on from that other side, uh, and here are my characters from this side. Oh, amazing. So I would, uh, you know, bring him on. Curtain and, call, that's and, it. And what we also do as well, uh, when the actor or when the puppet is speaking, uh, we shake it like that. Uh, yeah. So you know he's speaking. So for example, who's that? And that's the mailman. So uh, the audio will say, Sir, I have some mail for you. <laughs> Fantastic. And the other character will say, oh, What is it today? Well, sir, I think it's. An, and then you get his footsteps disappearing. And in particular with this character, John Augustus is getting to the end of his tether here because his wife Jane is spending more money than, than they've got. So there is a scene here where the mailman is coming in constantly with bills. Right. Oh, I have another lot of money. Oh, not another bill. And off he goes. Sir, I have another lot. Oh, not another bill. Jane, what has she been doing? And then we come back. Oh, not another bill. And we have about half a dozen examples of not another bill. Oh, what am I doing? So maybe part of the scene will be, uh, oh, I have another letter for you, sir. Oh, no. And I mean, he's all saying, oh, no. Um, <laughs> we've heard that your son has been involved with some lady from, and, she, and she's not married. Oh, shame, shame. <laughs> uh, and so we've got lots of cue cards like that. And we've got some things that make noises that sometimes we give to the kids and we say, just knock it on the table when you need to. And, uh, make sure you shout, and that keeps them going. They'll, they'll shout yeah. and scream at us when we throw these things up. I used to have a smaller uh, version of that when I was younger. Did you? Ready? Yep. <laughs> One of our historians went down to London to see what artifacts we could find relating to this place, and they come across a set of oil or, or uh, whatever they're called, drawings, I'll just call them drawings, that were up for sale. So she went to have a look at them and she found that this one here, along with another one, is Della Priabi. Goodness, you wouldn't think it, would you? Total coincidence, it's her library. Yeah, she did, sorry. Did she mention it? Yeah, she did. So that, that was a painting done by someone sitting in that, well, sitting in that corner. So we were fortunate that we hadn't begun the restoration in the library yet, so when we saw that, we changed the colours and we found the painting that it is there, up here, and everything put back wow. to the way it was.
Well, the storm they promised is definitely here, Suzanne.